Finally tonight, just how much research about a deadly flu virus should be made available to the public? It's a question many are asking this week in the fields of science, bioterrorism, and national security. Ray Suarez has our own conversation on the subject, following some background. Hong Kong, 1997. A virus that kills chickens and other fowl is seen for the first time in a major outbreak among humans. Since then, there have been several other occurrences of the H5N1 bird flu, mostly in Asia. Overall, about 600 people have contracted the disease, and more than half have died. The good news so far? The virus is hard to transmit from person to person, and health officials have been largely able to contain outbreaks. On day one, there were two people, and then four, and then 16. Don't talk to anyone. Don't touch anyone. Stay away from other people. In the popular imagination, and in films like this year's Contagion, viruses mutate and multiply relentlessly through the population. In fact, scientists have looked into whether something like that could happen with avian flu, in part to better understand how it might be combated. Researchers at the University of Wisconsin and Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands were able to create a highly transmissible form of the virus in ferrets. But this week, in an unprecedented step, a government panel that reports to the National Institutes of Health and other agencies, called the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, asked prominent journals, Science and Nature, not to publish some of the details of the biological experiments recommending that the general conclusions highlighting the novel outcome be published, but the manuscripts not include the methodological and other details that could enable replication of the experiments by those who would seek to do harm. The question of publishing all the details of the studies has stoked a debate over balancing the need for open scientific dialogue and concerns about national security. We look at those questions now with two principal players in this story. Dr. Anthony Fauci is the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. His institute co-funded some of the research, and he speaks on behalf of the NIH tonight. And Bruce Alberts is the editor-in-chief of the journal Science, deciding what to publish and not publish about this research. Dr. Fauci, let me start with you. Is an arm of the federal government ever asked scientists not to public the, publish the fruits of their research? In the biological sciences, in sciences, this truly, uh, Ray, is, is, is un, it's a new paradigm. It's unprecedented. So we've really got to get it right. I mean, there's an absolute need to do kinds of research that will help protect the general and global public. But there are times, as is the case now, where the results, if gotten into the hands of people with nefarious purposes could, in fact, be dangerous to society. So we need to strike a balance, an appropriate balance, of not impeding the science, but at the same time uh, protecting the general public who has concerns over the possibility that information like this may get into the hands of people who would use it for nefarious purposes. But the answer to your question is, this is the first time and this advisory board that you mentioned, the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, made the recommendation to the Health and Human Services Department and to the authors and the journal editors to publish the data, but to leave out the details that would allow people who might use it for uh, purposes that are not purposes for the public health, but nefarious purposes, they would not have ready access to this. But also, it's important to point out that the scientists and public health officials, particularly those who are surveying and looking at this virus, particularly in Southeast Asia, have access to the information in its fullest. And that's really the discussion right now, is how do we do that? How do we, how do we get that delicate balance between open scientific intercourse as well as safety of the general public? And that question, I guess, uh, Bruce Albert, lands in your lap. How, this is a request. They can't make you not publish it. How do you walk that line between what can be released and what should be released? Well, that's a great question, Ray. It's what we've been struggling with. Science uh, flourishes because of its openness and the, the ability of other scientists to reproduce and build on results. But in this case, uh, this very distinguished advisory board, which I should point out is, was set up uh, on the recommendation of the National Academy of Sciences shortly after 9-11. Uh, 
and contains outstanding scientists as well as security experts. This is the first time, uh, after looking at many other cases over the past seven years, this is the first time they came down on this side of the, uh, of the decision, that is to restrict some of the information. So personally, I think uh, as the Supreme Court, so to speak, of make this decision-making process, the journals should try very hard to, uh, to, to comply with their request. On the other hand, we have to make sure that they have the means, and we're waiting for them to uh, demonstrate that, they have the means to get this information for those in Asia and elsewhere around the world who have a real need to know the details. Dr. Fauci, this is specialist information going out to a pretty selective reading audience. Uh, could a paper on lab work with viruses really be useful to someone who wants to create a superbug? Well, if you have the mutations that are associated with easy transmissibility from animal to animal, in this case ferrets, as you mentioned, Ray, as well as maintaining uh, its virulence or its, or its lethality, someone with a degree of expertise, it's not somebody that's going to do this in their backyard, but you don't want to have the blueprint for that be out uh, for individuals who might have nefarious uh, purposes. But as, as uh, Dr. Alberts mentioned very appropriately, the entire basis of the scientific enterprise is to share information so that others can verify it and go to the next step so that the ultimate public health good will be attained. So that's, that's the balance that we're dealing with. But information such as this could possibly, and I say possibly, there's not, I mean, remember now, we're dealing with it with an animal model and in an abundance of caution. Uh, the uh, advisory board made the recommendation to withhold this information. And I think what people need to know, there's no guarantee whatsoever that this virus as it exists would be transmitted, but it has characteristics in a mammal model that's the closest we get to a human model, not a perfect model, but as close as you get. It does maintain and develop these characteristics, which are of concern if the ability to make such a virus gets into the hands of people who would use it for nefarious purposes. Bruce Alberts, you heard Dr. Fauci's misgivings. Do you think someone reading your magazine could figure out how to create a superbug if they didn't already know how to do it? Uh, hopefully not. That's what we're dealing with. We don't want to put the information that's uh, very useful to uh, terrorist organizations into the public if we could be convinced that the people who need to know that information will have it. To me, this. Uh, experiment, which I, uh, scientists say had very surprising results. It wasn't thought to be so easy uh, to do this, and it, you know, a small, relatively small number of uh, mutations apparently will allow this flu virus to become uh, transmissible through the air, uh, through aerosols, and, and that, that could cause enormous uh, pandemic uh, in a human population. So to me, this work was important to do, and, and it has a major message, which is we have to do uh, even more than we're now doing to protect the world against this virus. Flu, I, I've been on many programs in the last few days talking to flu experts, and many of them feel that this is by far the greatest uh, threat to our uh, public health uh, per, per, uh, from infectious diseases. And I think this is a call to action uh, by scientists, uh, even scientists who never work with flu, to, to, to work uh, even harder and more effectively on protecting the public. Well, quickly before we go, I'll ask you both, gentlemen, first you, Anthony Fauci, whether now that this is done, can the information that's been derived from this research be given to those who really need it, who are combating uh, dangerous <coughs> flu viruses, without it gradually seeping out into a wider world? Information doesn't seem to be like that in 2011. That is a concern, Ray. Uh, very clearly, when things get out there, there certainly is a possibility, if not a likelihood, that sooner or later this is information that's going to get out. In fact, you know, in innocence, not thinking that this would be voted to be held down by the board, the investigators actually made a partial presentation of the data at a meeting uh, uh, outside of the country, a regular scientific meeting of exchange of information. So although we'll try our best to get to that balance that Dr. Alberts and I have been speaking at, there's no guarantee that when information gets passed back and forth to scientists, even those who have a need to know, that it might actually ultimately leak out. Because as we know from experience in other 
disciplines, it is very, very difficult to keep something secret when it's information. Quickly, Bruce Albert, same question. Can you keep information oh. bottled up? Not, not for ever, for sure, and this will leak out eventually. And I think this is a wake-up call to the scientific and health communities to be, be more prepared than we are today for such outbreaks. And, uh, and I would like to uh, make sure that uh, we focus on that going forward. Bruce Alberts, Anthony Fauci. Gentlemen, thank you both. You're welcome. Thank you.